having said that, I'm now going to put Rick on the spot to tell us how they solved the problem. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be out here on the West Coast. 70 degrees in Boston right now. I am going to talk to you about a company that was created in a laboratory at uh, Partners Healthcare in Boston, a laboratory that was searching for how we could solve the problem of not enough doctors for all the baby boomers. Since many of this audience is after the baby boomers will have cleared the earth of every resource imaginable. <laughs> inspiration is the fact that this country is drowning in disease that is self-inflicted. Eating too much, eating the wrong foods, drinking too much, smoking still, not getting any exercise, spending five hours in front of a television set. A highly sedentary population that is now two-thirds either overweight or obese. Now you know why Gary called me the leader of the wet blanket brigade. <laughs> so we have these images of our population and this glorification of our growing population. We have waistlines that are increasing every decade. And not even Dr. Phil can solve this problem. <laughs> It comes down to choices. It comes down to what do I want to do versus what should I do. Should is a loaded word. A lot of people don't like hearing it. So we end up with this kind of scenario. <laughs> and there's some doctors in the room who have had this very discussion with their patients. And they've tried to explain this, and they've gotten nowhere. What this results in when the patient, the consumer, the person, people like you and me, when we decide to do what we want to do versus what we should do, we end up with a trillion dollars added to our nation's health care budget, our economy. A trillion dollars of self-inflicted disease from eating, drinking, smoking, and not getting enough exercise. Diabetes is really the heart of the problem. There are 19 million of us with type 2 diabetes. We have uh, grown in type 2 diabetes prevalence 356% over the last three decades. And yet, we can't beat this. I, I'm sorry, I should back up. I was asked by the speakers, or the organizers, these wonderful people, to have some oh shit moments. <laughs> and it just didn't really fit with my Boston background, so I'm going to call these uh, wicked pissa moments. <laughs> so one wicked pissa moment is that diabetes is just growing, growing, growing. In fact, we have these challenges where the message from the public service announcements, remember a brain is a terrible thing to, to fry or whatever it was. Um, there's been some really powerful PSAs, but not in this area of eating, drinking, smoking.
smoking and not getting enough exercise. It's a 100 to 1 ratio of the messaging that is glorifying McDonald's and trans fats and high fructose corn syrup. And yet we're cutting recess, we're cutting physical education out of the high schools, and we're cutting prevention out of the budgets. Just uh, two weeks ago in Congress, in order to fix the Medicare physician payment problem, they took $8 billion out of the prevention fund and put that into the Medicare fix for doctors' payment. Another wicked PISA moment is that everybody uses their insurance. In the real world of insurance, you have fire insurance or home insurance. You have home insurance that protects you against floods. You have car insurance. You have car insurance in your home insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of claims, but those claims are spread across 300 million Americans. And that's called spreading the risk or mitigating the risk. That's called insurance, where a few people use the insurance, the rest of us pay for it. In healthcare, we all use the insurance and we all pay for it. So it, there is no insurance. It is called healthcare, not health insurance. And when we went about the Affordable Care Act, you don't hear the word insurance in that because we are literally paying for this generation with the younger generation's dollars. That's how much, how expensive healthcare has become. And yet we have people who want to get supersized on the federal government's dime because they don't have any skin in the game. They're not paying for their health care. So what does it matter if you put on five or ten more pounds? Somebody else is going to have to pay for it. So our wicked PISA moment is that we've got to shift accountability back to us. We've got to get it back on our shoulders or this country is going down in flames. So the challenge is to consumerize health plans. And this is not an easy challenge. Health plans are, frankly, um, our customers. So, I don't want to say too many bad things about them, but they are reviled by consumers. And if we're going to serve consumers as we serve our health plan clients, then we obviously have to figure out how to get the consumers not to hate the health plans as much as they do. And this wicked PISA uh, <coughs> awakening had to do with a study on call centers just published this January. Uh, there were 18 different industries that have call centers that were looked at, 206 companies in the 18 industries, and healthcare was represented by 13 health plans of the 206 plan companies. There was a one to five rating of the 10,000 consumer survey. Three was okay, four was good, five was excellent, <coughs> two and one were poor and really bad. Wicked piss up. We ended up with one health plan getting an okay rating, and that was Kaiser. The other 12 were either poor or really poor. And the industry as a whole, rated by these 10,000 consumers, was the worst of the 18 industries. We've selected health plans as our client. <laughs> so, what are the features of a consumer centric healthcare service company that could actually succeed in stimulating and inviting consumers in, making it less of a health service or a health plan business and more of a life business. The lives that everybody in this room who said, I'm a quantified self, are already living. It would mean transparent pricing like Walmart. It would mean gaming like Zynga. We'd look for social media like Facebook. We 
We'd want to see crowdsourcing like the Pepsi challenge. We'd want to see pattern recognition. That's what machine learning is now called. It used to be called pattern recognition, and it's what Netflix and Amazon do when they take your data and then learn something about you and communicate back to you. It's what Foursquare does with badges. It's what Starbucks <coughs> does when they, sick, they stick 16 drink options on the board right behind the baristas when in fact there's 660 concoctions they can make that you can pour down your throat. But only 16 to choose from because 660 is too many choices and choice architecture is about limiting choices featuring the ones that you want to feature. A consumer centric healthcare service would have engagement tactics like Procter & Gamble it would have self-service, self-management techniques, tools, uh, checkout counters like Lowe's and Home Depot and CVS, Caremark. It would have branding like Apple and Nike, and it would have the insurance appeal of Progressive. So we thought that was a pretty good idea. That sounded like a business that we could create. We built a user interface model that was varied, that was customized, that was personalized. Android, Blackberry, iPhone, iPad, the web, you can email. <coughs> we're available in all those different locations. So we're playing to little snippets of all different populations. We're involving more than one device. We're device agnostic. So we're looking at not just Fitbit, but 60 other accelerometers that are measuring steps and active minutes and activity like that. We're looking at blood pressure cuffs, many different ones that send wireless systolic and diastolic information into our platform. We're looking at the Telcare uh, glucose meter. This is one of our partners. It sends your glucose wirelessly, the like score, put it into your glucose meter and wirelessly it gets shipped to our platform, integrated into our machine learning asset, and we have a digital scale. So in total there are about 65 different wireless devices that are compatible with our platform. That's the platform, that's the machine learning technology. It's servicing not only consumers like you, but it's aggregating data for the health plan. The health plans are about outcomes, not about sales. So when you're in the health plan world, you're trying to demonstrate that your intervention will make a meaningful difference in healthcare spend. Our, our platform is a SaaS model, so it generates digital coaching. No people involved, no doctors, no nurses. It's all algorithms and neural networking and clustering and lots of fancy mathematical uh, functions that I have no idea how they work, but they're very smart people in this room who probably do. And then we get results. As I said, we're an outcome business. So in 2011, we touched 850 <coughs> hypertensives, about uh, 98 or 97% of those that we invited to join our program joined. After three months, 69% were still sending us wireless blood pressure data. It was their data put into our system and then contextualized and sent back to their smartphone so that they could see the trend one data point is of no value to a doctor or a consumer, but a trend is meaningful. And when you show a trend that's either going up or down, up means you're not doing as well as you should, and down means yes you are. So you have that third glass of wine, you go next morning, put on the blood pressure cuff, oh my god, 142 over 97. That's 15% higher than it was yesterday. Biofeedback loop tells me that maybe that third glass of wine was associated with it, or maybe that rich dinner I had at that fancy restaurant in downtown Palo Alto, maybe that was it. 
or maybe it was the fact that I only got four hours of sleep because I came from Boston and I was on East Coast. <laughs> it's called Biofeedback Loop. You've all seen it. Uh, I think Gary's written about it. Um, it's, it's really uh, a major uh, change in barriers. If, if you think about the, the classic uh, speed, speed situation, um, you're driving down the road, you see an electronic sign that says you're over the speed limit, you take your foot off the gas pedal, biofeedback loop. So, what are the lessons that we've learned? We've learned that sooner is better than later, more is better than less. We've learned that BC engagement is a blood sport, <laughs> not to be trivialized. And we've learned don't work with jerks. Thank you very much. Going and we'll do that for a little bit and then we'll.